Hello, this is another episode of Conversation in Artificial Intelligence. This is Paolo, your host, and it is an honor and privilege to have you here. Today, we're going to go into a very interesting topic. It's the first time we look at this topic, and it's basically how you build an intelligence system. So the question is not whether or not how you make money with an intelligence system, but it's rather how you build a machine learning product. And with us today, book author and uh, machine learning veteran, Jeff Halton from Seattle. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It is, uh, it is a pleasure. Jeff, you have had uh, a very, very long career in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So tell us a little bit, how did uh, everything start? Well, I went to grad school maybe 20 years ago, something like this. And I went to be a software engineering researcher. And I talked to my advisor the first few times and he asked me a lot of questions, blah, 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 go read these papers, whatever. Um, and I was a little discouraged by it and I was walking down the hall and then along came this new young professor, didn't have any grad students yet. We started talking, he was a machine learning guy, Pedro Domingo, so you might've heard of him. He was just very excited about machine learning and the potential and the future. And he just sucked me right in and took me right into the machine learning world. And that's how my career started. So, and then uh, 20 years after, uh, we came up with this. So what is this? This is building intelligent systems. So the way I met Gaff is basically because I was desperately looking for a book like this. And so I made my research on Amazon or on Audible and so on. And I found this book. Why I found this book? Because I thought, I thought there was a big problem in the machine learning artificial intelligence world. And the problem is, you get into all these mega classes of statistics and in the math or coding, but you never get the big picture. How do I build a product that works? Like, what do I need to know? What is the, the knowledge hand to hand? And finally, I found this book. And I thought this book really answered that uh, questions that I had in mind. And then from there, I contacted him. So that's basically the, the long story short. This is a very good book, by the way, especially for engineering manager, product managers, and whoever I think has an interest to understand the process around machine learning. Jeff, yeah, I have a very simple question. How did you come up with the idea to, to write a book like this? Yeah, so I worked at the big software companies doing applied machine learning on very large systems. Um, I call them internet scale systems. That is, they have hundreds of millions of interactions with users per day. And we could legitimately break the internet if we do stuff wrong. And, you know, when I started at this, people didn't know how to deploy machine learning into these systems and do it safely and efficiently and run them over their life cycle. They didn't know how to work together to get the people with the statistics skills working with the engineers, working with the program managers. Well, this book is the pattern that me and about a couple hundred co-collaborators developed over the past 15 years to build these types of systems and run them at scale. What it is that uh, made you thinking to, there is a need to understand more of the processes on how we go and build the systems over writing maybe an entire chapter on how we classify our works and the, the typical things that you find on, you know, on Udemy and, and so on. What is the insight that made you thinking, we need this, like people need this, why people need this? I came to computer science, I went to grad school to do software engineering. And some of the books that influenced me a lot in my early days were things like, you know, Mythical Man Month and these things about how do you bring a bunch of people together and produce working systems. And so what I think those add is, you know, there's all these base skills like programming languages, operating systems, graphics, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to go beyond solving toy problems and solve real systems, there's a couple other skills that you need. And these are called things like program management, architecture, design patterns. These are the ways to bring these systems together and produce large working systems. And I saw a, a gap in the machine learning world because now you have to add new base skills, statistics, modeling, machine learning, um, data, that type of stuff. But there was nothing that updated those higher level skills, those architecture design patterns, um, program management skills to teach those people how to use these new tools to achieve the impact they want to achieve. So it was just a combination of my experience, my interests, and me seeing a need that led me to sit down and do this book. 
So I think, and I share this uh, vision with you, that uh, there is definitely a, a need for a variety of professionals to understand how to really uh, build these systems. And I like, uh, you know, to give our ad audience now a little bit of flavor of uh, what it is that they should uh, look at. And here is the question. In today's world, there is a lot of buzz around machine learning, artificial intelligence. So company managers and, uh, you know, whoever feels obliged to do something with machine learning. But when do we really need machine learning? And now do we understand if we need machine learning? Yeah, this is a great question because there's so much pressure for everyone to be a machine learning person and to do machine learning. And if you're not doing it, you're being left behind. So let me talk about sort of two extremes. On the one extreme, there's very simple things. And these are, you could think of it as, if you think you're gonna have to modify a program five, six, seven times to get it right, you probably don't need machine learning. And, and an example I use for this is, you wanna write a program to update someone's bank balance. They withdraw some money, update a new balance, maybe some transaction tracking, that sort of stuff. Machine learning would be terrible there because it's very simple to understand, very contained, and the cost of mistakes are high. On the other hand, there's four categories of problems where you might imagine you're gonna to need to update your system hundreds or maybe even thousands or tens of thousands of times before you get it right. So let me quickly go through these four areas. One is very large problems. I mean, imagine you're going to a library and you need to classify every book in the library you know, from scratch to get them in the right places. That could take a long time. But on the internet, there's more content than that. There's more content than 100 people could watch in their lifetimes or 1,000 people could watch in their lifetimes. If you wanna classify everything at the very large scale like this, you probably want to use machine learning to get a start and to make progress on the problem. But it's worse than that because what we have in the world aren't just large problems. We have open-ended problems. And that means there's more content being created every day. So, you know, if your problem is open-ended and things are coming in day after day after day and you need to respond to them, you probably could use machine learning. It would be a great tool. The third category is time-changing problems because things change. Uh, your system might have been right for yesterday, but now a big storm has come and everything is different and you need to adapt your intelligence. There's so many reasons that things change that you might want to look into machine learning if your domain has large frequent changes. And finally, there's just hard problems like computer or human perception, winning open-ended games like Go, landing rocket ships. I mean, these things are just hard and these would be good cases for machine learning. So what you have to do is look at your problem if it's simple and you can update a few times to get it right, probably try to start without machine learning. But if your problem is large, open-ended, time-changing, or intrinsically difficult, you might want to look at machine learning. So for the common man, I think uh, uh, one, one, uh, one example that I found very interesting in your book was this uh, example of the toaster. And uh, right. let's suppose... Let's suppose we want to uh, basically have a toaster that works for everybody in the world and doesn't have any knob. And you just put the toast in and he knows exactly what you want. And, and, and just, and just uh, you know, it gives us the, the perfect toast. How do we go about designing such a toaster? This is a funny story. When I first started writing this book, I was talking with one of my friends and he said, well, you need an example of when you absolutely wouldn't need machine learning and you should use a toaster as that example. And I said, okay, challenge accepted. Let's see why machine learning might help a toaster in surprising ways. And it's interesting. The user interface of a toaster is very simple. You put in the toast, you press the lever, maybe you set the temperature, but there's all sorts of things that happen. Uh, number one, the toast might not be done, so you need to retoast it. Number two, somebody might have changed the setting, you missed it, you put in your toast, the toast is gonna to burn. So, you know, why do we need to deal with these problems? So let's look at it. Let's imagine what um, fancier toaster could be. Let's add a temperature sensor to the toaster. So when you put something in it, the, the toaster knows how cold it is. Let's put a weight sensor so it knows how much mass is in there. Let's put a clock so we know if we're toasting in the morning or toasting in the evening. Let's do GPS so we know what country you're in with, you know, maybe di different tastes are different in different countries. And let's put in a camera so that when you walk up to the toaster, it knows just who it is. So it can personalize the toast just for you. Now, just imagine all the toasting that's been going on through the history of humanity and all the human attention that's being placed on this. What if all of that data and all of that intelligence was being sent up to a server 
where we could learn what are the right things to do. Using all this extra context, I, there's no reason that we need to have a knob and a lever on a toaster. And it, it's just interesting to think that, you know, you don't have to do big fancy things to make a valuable product for people. You could do something simple and just solve it very well if you can do the machine learning efficiently and reliably enough. So I like to, you know, go into something slightly more, if you like, more technical. But sure. today we are so much used to going to things like Facebook and getting, you know, getting a bunch of stuff of information recommended. And what I get recommended is not what other people get recommended. Or we go on Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, and it seems like the information that we get it's organized according to some level of intelligence if you like on the other end this uh, experience that we get it's also pretty effective how do we go about thinking the relationship between the experience that we get as user and really the nitty-gritty elements of machine learning yeah i think this is an interesting thing that uh isn't covered much you know, when you go and take a machine learning class, because in general, when you take a machine learning class, they start you out and say, here's your data set, go build a model of your data set. And, but in practice, when you're using machine learning, you're building the application and the machine learning simultaneously. And so you need to think of how are my user interactions with my product going to turn directly into the training data I can use to make the product better. And I call this a closed loop intelligence system where Usage of the system makes users happy, but it also provides the data to make the system better so that users are more happy the next time that they use it. So in the example of like, um, you said recommender systems or even something simple that everyone's familiar with a search engine. You go to a search engine and you type in a query, it's gonna give you back five, six, seven answers. Um, and those answers are ordered by which ones the machine learning thinks are most relevant. But when a user looks at those answers, they may select the third or the fourth answer and click on it. And that click is an explicit, or I would say an implicit measurement or a signal that the fourth answer was actually the best one. And so the machine learning can use these interactions to get better over time. And when you look at any other system that wants to leverage machine learning, you really have to think, how do I change the experience so that as the user is using it the way they want to use it, we get the information we need to make it better. So that's one element is how we get the machine learning better, if you like. Mm -hmm. But the other element is also that the machine learning could influence the users in ways that, you know, make the user, if you like, not discovering things or in somewhat biasing the user. How do you go about thinking about those circumstances and limiting those as well? Yeah, it's really uh, difficult to develop a great experience to hook up to machine learning. And you're probably gonna have to iterate and you're probably gonna have to think about a lot of these issues like feedback loop and you might need to look into a little bit of reinforcement learning. But I'll say at a high level, some of the things that you wanna do are you need to connect the context of exactly what the user is seeing to what outcome they get. Was it a good outcome or a bad outcome? You need to be able to connect those things quickly enough so that you know that the machine learning's decision led to the outcome that the user got and there weren't other factors intervening. You need to be very careful when you set up your user experience that you don't create biases. For example, in a spam filter, if a spam message goes into the user's inbox, they're likely to hit, hey, this is spam and give you that report. But if a legitimate message goes into the user's junk folder, the user's not as likely to find it and click a button to say, no, this is actually good. So, um, you know, just simple things about how you set up your user experience could lead to big biases and big problems. And then at the end of it, you might always want to have some sort of backstop, some sort of question that you ask your users. And like 1% of the time or 0.1% of the time, you pop up a dialogue and say, here's what we were thinking of doing. Would that be good or would that be bad? And you can use those as backstop training labels or certainly for testing your systems. So lots of the large social media splash internet companies today, they, they influence us in various ways. So for example, Facebook and uh, YouTube in particular, they provide us with certain content, but this content that they provide us 
is content that comes from a little bit of our interest, but also what they have defined as interesting for the masses. Is there kind of a limit of this experience, this intrinsic limit that they're hiding something that might be interesting to us? Well, yeah, that's a very hard problem. And it's timely that these systems, you know, you see it in the news all the time of bias and influence and the politics stuff. It's, it's uh, interesting that there is such bifurcation in what people want. And if you just let machine learning go alone, it can um, lead, and, and this is a real challenge, is it'll lead people down rat holes where it gets into something it thinks they like and takes them deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And very quickly, it's into uh, crazy parts of the internet. That's certainly one of the risks in a system like this. And so what you need to do is have um, really great measurements so that you understand which users are getting which experiences. And you need to be able to define uh, what boundaries you want to set for your system. So you can trigger when the intelligence is starting to go a little bit crazy. And um, what I like to call these things are guardrails. You wanna say this machine learning should never be able to make a particular prediction. And so, um, Every big system that I've worked on has had a combination of some human intelligence with some computer intelligence so that, you know, you let the computer intelligence solve what it's good at, but you put the guardrails to make sure that it doesn't cause problems. So when we really look at, uh, you know, measuring this type of intelligence systems and, and basically for intelligence systems, just that everybody understand, we, we mean not just the machine learning algorithm, but the entire application, if you like, the entire product, the entire thing that we experience with the machine learning inside, but it's, it's the entire user experience, it's the entire uh, backend systems, it's the entire orchestration that is behind. So you don't need to, to understand all of the details of this, but just think of it as, as the big package. It's not just the machine learning core. Think of it like a machine learning being the brain of this uh, of this package, but but you have other things uh, inside. How do we measure if something is working? Yeah, there's sort of there's two levels of answers to this, um, and so maybe I I can give them both, and you can choose which one you like. The first one is how do you define the right metrics and define success for your intelligent system? A lot of times, a machine learning person will come along and say, "Oh, it's my false positive rate or my false negative rate," but um, that's very disconnected from what your users are actually perceiving. Um, so generally, you have some hierarchy of goals. At the first, you want to have a good model, of course. But at the second step, you want to talk about what outcomes your users are getting. And that's a combination of did the model say the right thing? And did the user experience encourage the user to achieve what they were trying to achieve? So you'll often look for metrics like um, if the user was trying to make their computer faster, the model predicted something for them to do, and their computer actually got faster. And so that, that's an example of a user experience. And of course, whenever you're building a big system, you need to look at longer term things like um, engagement and sentiment of your users as they're using your system and finally business outcomes. And, and so in general, whenever you're defining success of an intelligent system, you need these four layers, model properties, user outcomes, leading indicators and business objectives. And you need some story of how they connect to each other. It won't always be easy, but it's very important to get it right. So you're sure you're building the right system. There's three sort of things you need to do when you're measuring an intelligent system. And, and these are, you know, the first one is what they teach in school. And that is how do you estimate the false positive and false negative rates or, you know, precision recall, whichever set of metrics you want to use. And this is really how well does your system generalize from the training data you've seen to the experiences it's going to encounter when you deploy it in the real world. And so, there's a one big assumption in machine learning, and that is that all the data is IID or identically independently distributed. That means each encounter your intelligence system has is completely independent of the others. If that's the case, you know, this stuff I've talked about is very powerful, but unfortunately it's never the case. When you're working in the real world, this fundamental assumption of machine learning is always violated. For example, let's say you have two training examples about sales that you made on your online site. And you'd say, well, those are two sales. Those are independent. But what if they were sales to the same customer? Now there's this dependence between that data. And if one piece of data is used for training your algorithms and one's used for evaluating your algorithms, you're not going to get a good analysis of what's actually happening. And these sorts of linkages and dependencies occur all over the place. And if you're not very careful, they're going to show up and affect your ability to test. 
But a third property that's also very important and goes back to the bias thing you were saying is you need to look at all the different subpopulations that might be using your system. You could imagine your algorithm is 95% accurate and you're going to say 95, that's great. It's a lot of work to get that good. Let's ship it. But what if it's 95% accurate for most people, but completely fails for anyone who's wearing glasses, you know, then you and I would come up to this system and we wouldn't be able to interact with it at all. And you, you might say that that is not an acceptable business case and that system is actually useless. You couldn't use it because there's all sorts of these subpopulations that are critical. You have, you know, gender, you have ethnicity, you have age, you have, um, and then you have like type of business or type of road that you're trying to classify. Um, so when you're testing a system, you really need to identify your critical subpopulations and do the work to make sure your system works there. So who are the people that uh, are going to test this in an organization that is as large as the ones that you have worked with? And, and who are the people that have to think really well what to test? I don't think that this field has been completely established yet. And I think each company does that type of work differently. I'll tell you my opinion of where it's going to go is that there's going to be engineers who build the core systems and the core experiences. Then there's going to be machine learning engineers who help link the machine learning into the system. Then there's going to be machine learning scientists who build the models and sit on top of the models. And those are the people who are going to watch day by day. They're going to be accountable to be sure that the system is running correctly. I've often called them, and a lot of people don't like this, but I call it something like the um, orchestrators of the system or machine learning operations. And these people need to understand how everything works end to end. They need to understand the business objectives. They need to have good empathy for the user and they need to tweak and adapt the system every day. So you are in a room and you want to have automation around your lightning. How do we go about thinking about this problem? How do we automate this? So smart homes are getting very, very big. And the problem is that there's so many different intelligent pieces and they don't work quite right together and they all have a little bit of mistakes. And so your house becomes really frustrating. I know I'm afraid to deploy this type of stuff in my house because I'm just sure my wife is gonna come up to me and say, I tried to flip the switch and the light wouldn't go on, what could I do? I'm gonna get in trouble. So um, you just have to, uh, when you're developing these sorts of systems, you have to keep in mind the accuracy of your intelligence and the type of experience that you're gonna enable. If you have a very, very accurate intelligence, you might wanna try to completely automate, for example, your lights. User walks in the room, the system notices, turns on a light. User leaves the room, system notices, turns off the light. If everything's perfect, that's perfect. You can rip your switches off your wall, everyone will be happy. But if you have mistakes, you really need to think of what experience can I do, given that I have mistakes, to make users actually happy. So one example is you could build a system that um, if it thinks the user's in the room, it might prompt them, would you like me to turn on the lights? You could say yes or no. A prompt is less forceful than an automation, so you can often use prompts with slightly worse intelligence. A third type of thing you could think about is just a little notification without even asking the user. For example, let's say I have a smartwatch and I've gone to work for the day, but I've left several lights on. The intelligence might notice this and it might put a little indicator on my watch that says, hey, you're using power, are you sure you want to? And if not, you just press the button there and then the lights in your home turn off. So you can see there's really a broad spectrum, there's a big matrix of all the different ways you could put intelligence into a product based on the quality of where you are and how um, mature your system is. Another concept I think that I wanna share with our audience here, and it's, it's uh, this concept of really understand the impact of the user experience into these intelligent systems. And one of the things that was interesting is this situation where you say, depending on the goal, the same thing can have two totally different uses. And I think in this case of the, of the light uh, or similar case, there is whether or not we want to do it for entertaining or maybe there is a sick person in the room that uh, needs care it changes completely. Maybe it could create a completely two different products. Can you talk about this idea of the same intelligence creates two totally different products? The example that you're talking about from the book was, uh, again, uh, with respect to the lighting. And so let's imagine you have a model and the model predicts the probability that somebody's in the room. 
here's two different products you could make. One product, the goal is to save power. This is part of you know, being green. You install it in your house, and if the model ever thinks that there's no one in the room and it should turn off the lights, it will turn off the lights for you. It'll never turn on the lights because that, you know, you can still go to the switch. But the point of this is just as a backstop in case you forget, it can turn off lights. Another product is, let's say you have an elder person in the home and you're worried they might trip on something. So you wanna be sure whenever they're in a room, the light is on and that could provide them safety. You could use exactly the same model but the experience will turn on a light if there's any chance at all there's a user in the room and leave the light on for an extended period of the time until it's very certain that the user has left the room. And you can, you know, you can use this to create different products. You can use this to create a product that gets more aggressive and solves harder and harder goals as you develop the intelligence. So you can sometimes plan an evolution of experiences as you get more data, as this closed loop I talked about before makes your intelligence better and better. So it's interesting, you can, you can start with the intelligence you can build today and work towards the goal you want to achieve in the future. Not always you can approach the solution of a problem thinking that day number one, you will get the perfect solution. Because think of this, as a human beings, we learn things over time. And this machine, even if the way of learning is slightly different or sometimes substantially different than the way we do, they still mimicking a learning process. So sometimes they cannot solve the problem completely in, in day number one, but they can get to the point that they can solve this, uh, this, this problem. I think this idea is uh, an idea that, of course, we find the reality, but also it, it comes out very crispy and crystalline uh, out of the book. The self-driving cars. And here's a case where if you want to develop a self-driving car, some companies have gone off and they're doing their own testing lab and they've been working for years and years and years and years trying to build up enough data to do it. Then there's another company that sells a self-driving car that isn't complete. It can do a little bit of self-driving, but in the process, users are using it. So let's say at first this car's promise is, I won't crash into a car in front of me because I use my sensors and stuff and make sure I don't hit the car in front of me. That's valuable to users. Users could buy this car. They'll drive it all over the world. And in the process, they'll be creating training data to go back to that car company's intelligence creation process. Then after you, whatever it is, six months, nine months of users collecting data, the uh, car company might say, well, now I'm going to do lane following because I've got all the telemetry of users driving this car and following lanes over millions and millions of miles, way more than they could have ever paid their own people to go collect. So they turn on lane following. And then after, I don't know, six months, a year, two years, three years, they're able to go the full distance and just turn on the complete self-driving. And it's the same sensors, the same car, the same customers, just the objective can change over time as they get better and better. What makes, what the term is this, this bias, bias in machine learning? Is it only the data or there is a component in the way that the humans are designing the systems that uh, maybe we could do better? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess there's many points of failures that could introduce bias into a system. And it's a very hard problem because I could identify 20 things I want to make sure I'm not biased against. And I could build a test matrix. And I think, you know, some of the news stories you see is that people were a little lazy and they didn't even bother to build this like 20 cell matrix of important things not to be biased against and get the test data that need to test it. Um, but there are like, if, if you dig in, there could be thousands or tens of thousands of very small subpopulations of people and machine learning will always be worse for some of those subpopulations than it is for others because machine learning makes mistakes and those mistakes might key on some property of that very small subpopulation. So um, it's, it's really a difficult problem. It's maddening. You need to allow ways for users to send feedback very quickly if they have a bad problem. You need to allow um, an architecture for your models so that you can carve off a small subpopulation that's having problems and inject special intelligence for them without having to worry about how that's going to affect everyone else. So that there are a lot of techniques, but it requires a real focus, it requires real work, and it requires a process and an architecture that allows you to address these problems over time. It looks like it is also the level of evolution of the technology that requires still a lot of uh, man thinking and, and you know, tweaking it and, and, and 
moving knobs and making it better. But the question is, when are we going to get the super intelligence that Elon Musk and, and, and Hollywood is talking about? When, when are we going to get that? It's an amazing time to be in machine learning. I open the newspaper all the time and I say, wow, a computer can do what now? You know, it's, it's very inspiring. But um, as somebody who works on it, I, I feel like I, maybe I see the man behind the curtain, if you want the Wizard of Oz uh, reference. And I, I see the scaffolding that was in place to make the particular thing work, or I see all the assumptions or how, how finely crafted that situation is. And I think this notion of general intelligence is, is very far away. And I, I don't know that I would, I would say people are even really working on it now. I, I mean, the, the, the successes we're having are, are not really in that direction, in my opinion. And so we're, we're quite a ways away from that. Uh, I don't know if Hollywood agrees, though. They just released this movie, uh, the, the Captain Marvel, that I watched. And I was uh, one of the, the scenes that I liked the most is uh, basically uh, she has to report. This entire society has to report to this, this supreme intelligence. So basically I substituted the religion has been substituted by the supreme intelligence and the supreme intelligence is artificial intelligence. Do you really think we're so far and, and uh, you know, we're so far away from the supreme intelligence that will control all of us? You know, you have a good point there because technology is changing faster and faster and faster and we may hit some inflection point and poof, it's there. So I believe that we're hundreds, I mean, many, many, many years away from this type of supreme intelligence, but I have a backup plan. I'm doing as much as I can to help the field of artificial intelligence. I'm doing as much as I can to help machines learn. I'm treating every machine very nicely. And my hope is that if the super intelligence comes along, it will remember the little bit I've done to help it and it will treat me and my descendants kindly. Geff, thank you so much. I wanted to thank our audience. Uh, this was a particularly interesting topic, in my opinion, because it covers really the overlap between the very technical aspect of machine learning, but also how you create products and how you create experiences for the users. So it's a really a continuum, and we look into this. If you have questions about this uh, particular video, just comment below, and if you have suggestions about similar things that you'd like to see just reach out to me. Thank you, Gaff, and uh, it was a pleasure having you here. Thanks, I really appreciate it.